Today, we're privileged to have uh, Richard Cunningham speaking to us on evangelism in the Western University. So uh, university is often considered the last best opportunity to become a Christian. It's a mission field that's ripe for the harvest. This webinar is going to consider some of the challenges facing university evangelism in the West, but these challenges are coming globally. We're going to look at current attitudes and culture wars, how we can best understand today's students and identity issues, free speech, censorship, and what having a biblical empathy in this context might mean. Uh, we're, we're really honoured and privileged to have Richard Cunningham today. Uh, Richard's a, a dear friend going back uh, over 30 years. I think Richard and I first met at St George's University in London, where there was uh, he was giving a talk on Islam, and I was there, and we got into some interesting discussions afterwards. He's been the director of the UCCF, which is the Universities and Colleges Christian Fellowship, uh, the branch UK uh, division of IFES, if you like, since the early uh, 2000s, 2004. But prior to that, he was executive director of the Areopagus Trust, de developing initiatives and confronting secular thought in universities across Britain and Europe. And at the same time, he was also the director of evangelism at St Andrew's Church in Oxford. He's previously served on UCCF staff before he became a uh, director as evangelism trainer. So uh, a long, long experience of evangelism and apologetics and leadership in British and Western universities. Richard, it's just a real pleasure to have you today. And we really look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Pete, thanks so much. And also, whilst I'm on, just a particular thanks to uh, uh, Christian Medical Fellowship in the UK. Uh, I have a, a middle son who's a doctor just currently for three months now in Egypt, in Aswan, volunteering at a missionary uh, hospital there. Uh, so huge thanks for all you do in the UK, but also across the world. So as Pete said in his introduction, I... I think we'd all agree that university is the last best opportunity to become a Christian. I'd argue that the best time to become a Christian is as early as possible. If you have the privilege of a Christian home, well, then you'll know what a privilege that is. I became a Christian as a teenager, but I realised at university that there are loads of guys all the same age, guys and girls, who have all of life ahead of them, the big choices to come. They have time on their hands. They don't mind having views different to their teachers or parents. So the reinvention is fine. I ran a, an Agnostics Anonymous group for five non-Christian friends, well, for more, but five of them became Christians. And subsequently, they married Christians. They raised uh, their kids to be Christians and got involved in local churches and so on and so forth. So university is a fabulous last best opportunity. Obviously, there's the international student thing. I'm not going to speak about that specifically. I'm looking at some of the, the secular challenges in the Western University. But just to say, following the, the massive opportunities with mainland Chinese studying in the West, we now have a huge and exciting number of Indian students that are increasingly coming, certainly to UK, but I would imagine other Western universities. And with Christian communities on campus, you find that non-Christians coming onto a university campus for the first time not only have a Christian friend often in Hall of Residence, but also are aware of a community of Christians. It might be a Christian medical fellowship group or typically a Christian union. And with events happening on their doorstep, it's a fabulous opportunity. Um, now, not all is well. Do you recognise these people on the screen and do you know what they have in common? Well, I'll put you out of your misery. Uh, those are the names. And basically all of them have in some way or other been either cancelled or no platformed uh, from university camp campuses. So Kathleen Stock, who was a lecturer at Sussex, JK Rowling, you obviously know, Jermaine Greer, Richard Dawkins were all uh, cancelled from, uh, uh, from campuses because of their view that... Uh, Trans women are not biological adult females, which we don't think is particularly controversial, but of course it is. And Peter Tatchell was cancelled from the University of Canterbury 
in something that like, I think it was 2016. A lot of this stuff happened around that time um, for actually saying that Jermaine Greer should have a right uh, to be on campus. Now, you'd think students would object to being treated like, like children, having good intelligent speakers cancelled from their campuses. But a survey of students uh, run by the National Union for Students says this, around two thirds, 63%, say the National Union of Students is right to have a no platform in policy. And just over half think the NUS is right to enforce the policy against individuals they believe threaten a safe space. The idea that in a free society, absolutely everything should be open to debate has a detrimental effect on marginalized groups. Now, that should come as a shock to us. Uh, it's certainly uh, a shock uh, to, um, to a number of, uh, uh, of intellectuals. Listen to, listen to this. The idea that in a free society, absolutely everything should be open to debate. Uh, sorry, let's go forward. Even universities, which are supposed to foster knowledge sharing and spirited debate, are now suppressing it. For example, by spinelessly rescinding speaker invitations to almost anyone that some group or other considers objectionable. When we fail to engage in such debates, when people choose safe spaces over tough discussions, we lose our best chance of building consensus on how to solve at least some of our society's pressing problems. That's uh, the uh, American uh, economist, Michael J. Boskin. I think even more concerning is something John Gray says, how that we haven't merely sort of um, resisted and lost the battle for free speech, but we've actually handed over our right to freedom of association, freedom of speech, uh, to the authorities in our university campuses, whoever those authorities we might consider to be. And Gray says this, when students from China study in Western countries, one of the lessons they learn is that the enforcement of intellectual orthodoxy does not require an authoritarian government. In institutions that proclaim their commitment to critical inquiry, Censorship is most effective when it is self-imposed. A defining feature of tyranny, the policing of opinion, is now established practice in societies that believe themselves to be freer than they have ever been. Now, to us, that is so obviously sinister and concerning. Uh, I'm Generation X, and just, I do qualify, and those of us who were Generation X or earlier, we saw the Berlin Wall come down and we regard freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of association as absolutely preconditions of a civilized and a flourishing society. When I was a student in the 80s, there were posters of Lech Walesa, who, of course, uh, objected to the communist authorities in Poland allowing his union to run the way they did. And he was an icon of free speech. Whereas Christian students today, Gen Z, uh, they will quite instinctively, as John Gray says, self-center in order to be kind, in order to avoid offense. Remember that slide? Around two thirds think the NUS is right to have a no platforming policy and that it should be enforced. So what do we do in all this? I think there are obviously two challenges, there are probably more, but one is to have the wisdom when to win battles and also the empathy of when to win hearts and minds. Now, with regard to uh, the wisdom to win battles, this really is a battle for free speech. I don't know about uh, in your universities what parts of the world you're from, but uh, free speech is enshrined in European law and uh, in British law, and it is a battle that must be fought. We must maintain that the law is actually uh, enforced in our universities and that people are not chilled in what they wish to say or the events they wish to put on. 
uh, I gave a I gave a written uh, contribution to the joint parliamentary committee that was looking into free speech in the university. I also asked a well-known KC, uh, a senior barrister, for an expert opinion on the freedom of religious and political societies uh, in our universities, and also had the opportunity directly to take this up with the then Prime Minister, Theresa May. So it's a battle I'm involved in and I'm passionate about, but there's also the fact that we need to win hearts and minds of the very students. I I find it easy to be impatient, to start calling Gen, Gen Z snowflakes, to pull themselves together, to tell them to, to be a bit, a bit bit more robust, but that isn't going to do anyone any good, probably not even me. When I've trained uh, speakers in doing lunch bar apologetic uh, speaking, including some fine people, Pete and others have sent my way from CMF. The three areas I suggest we, we, we must be clear on is that we identify well with our audience. We show that we understand them, their world. We're sympathetic to their difficulties, to their, their objections, but that we persuade them towards the biblical view, show them it's coherent, that it has explanatory power, that we can live by it. Uh, and of course, invite them to move from something that isn't true and coherent and transformative to, to the gospel that is. In the situation we find ourselves now, identification is the big, big deal. If we don't do enough identification, whatever we say that we think is compelling, convincing, apologetically sound, it really will just bounce off, humanly speaking. So we do have to identify well in order to connect well. And to identify well, we need to understand that safety is seen to be the ultimate right of this generation. And identity is at the heart of being safe. And we'll explore those very briefly. So first of all, safety. Why do students crave safety? There's an excellent article. I think you can still get it for free in the Atlantic magazine. There has been a subsequent book uh, that's come out um, that you can look up also, just Google coddling of the American mind. But there was a surge in crime from the 60s to 90s. This is, of course, when Gen X uh, were growing up and that they, of course, eventually became parents. There were stories of abducted children uh, being reported more. The actual incidence of abdu abductions has never really changed in the last hundred years. Gen X grew up scared of AIDS, and as a result, um, free-range childhood became less common uh, in the 80s and 90s when they became parents. Now, I used to be able to go out age 11 on my bicycle on a Saturday and be out after breakfast and not need to come home until it was getting dark. Those days have gone. Zero tolerance of bullying in schools, in other institutions health and safety, safeguarding risk assessments, protected characteristics, all good things, all necessary things in their place. But what they're all saying is safety is everything. And in recent years, there's been a real focus and a very healthy focus in many ways on mental health and acknowledging the importance of, of observing that. And also the whole issue of trauma, of being traumatized. Now, all those who've come into the mix, and therefore, any student who doesn't feel safe, who feels triggered, who feels traumatized by something that's said, um, must be protected. And that is a far greater good than me feeling the importance of free speech, speaking loudly into the microphone. So identity, very briefly, so the whole identity politics, you might want to ask questions on this. Uh, there is increasingly an inability to speak across different identities. And our identities uh, are, are often uh, focused on our ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, disability, maybe our religion. And in modern society, uh, there is a pecking order of vulnerable and minority groups. Some people um, perhaps refer to this as 
victimhood and the, and some people rather sneeringly call it the victimhood olympics so i as a straight white uh, male evangelical christian would have a very low score in the intersectionality uh, of victimhood of vulnerability and with a a, a more of a, a, a kind of i don't want to use this term but i'm going to but with a, a more of a cultural marxist critique um what means is that what it means is that power must be redistributed away from people like me to those who intersect uh, a lack of pri privilege a lack of a voice who are represent perhaps one or a number of minority uh voices and when you're redistributing power you're not about educated discourse free speech let's debate this it's about emotional reasoning. Who's the most hurt? Who has done the most hurting? And there's a critique of power structures and a reminder to people like me, middle-aged, white, straight, male, to check my privilege. I'm complaining at the lack of free speech. Well, Richard Cunningham, check your privilege, you poor thing. You've had the mic, the microphone for so long, and now you're complaining because you can't have it for much longer. So, Gen Z and the younger millennials, they value kindness above what they think of the power play of free speech. And providing safety from harmful, hateful or triggering speech is absolutely essential to creating a kinder society. So we really mustn't attack anyone's identity, especially if they're from a minority group. And obviously that has implications in, in evangelism because we might be talking about human view of sexuality, we might be talking about Islam, um, and people can feel really attacked, especially if we seem to suggest that Christianity uh, is uniquely true in terms of the claims of Jesus. Forgive me for rattling through, but I really need to. Now, this challenges us in the Western University in all sorts of ways, but obviously in evangelism, there are the free speech threats I've mentioned, but there is the self-censorship by Christians. Christians are going to avoid saying certain things. It might be about heaven and hell to avoid traumatizing their friends. It might be about some other of the more forensic aspects of the gospel and certainly not talk about sexual ethics or perhaps medical ethics generally for fear of offense. There's also a lack of confidence in the goodness of the gospel. If people are locating their identity uh, in things, immutable characteristics, as they might call them, although some of them are not, and we're actually saying to people, look, um, heterosexual, heterosexual monogamous marriage is the one place where you can express yourself sexually. And within, outside of that, you must, you must, you must, exercise restraint now that that is a hateful thing to say and to ask people to become christians if they're if they're muslim do we as christians really believe that that the gospel is good news for lgbt friends for muslim friends and of course christians today are happier to share than to proclaim or debate and sharing is great but there are times when the gospel has to be proclaimed in a heraldic way, showing it to be true, showing it to withstand um, critical questions. Okay, here's, here's a little question for you on all this. Do you think the demise of new atheism is a victory for Christianity? This might sound tangential, but I don't think it is. Now, I think those of us who are Christians are not surprised that uh, such a worldview that's lacking in a proper ability to describe humanness. It just doesn't have the range or the depth or the beauty, uh, the explanatory power. We're not surprised to see uh, such a view begin to disappear. But of course it disappeared, not because, I've, I'm sure, not because of its lack of, of, of explanatory power, its lack of sympathy for the human condition, but really because of the new morality. Almost overnight, the new atheists were seen to be homophobic, or certainly transphobic, 
They were seen to be misogynist and brutal in the things they said and the way they said them. But those very tools that have pulled down new atheism, and I don't miss it particularly, but those same tools are being sharpened to attack Christianity. So what do we do here? Well, there are three false moves, certainly. One is to compromise the gospel and to remove the offensive elements. One is to withdraw altogether, really, and just have Christian friends and not risk getting into this brawl and be accused of being transphobic and everything else. Or the other is to just be irritated and to do echo chamber evangelism and just shout the same things louder and slower, effectively speaking for, to people who believe what we already believe. Now, those are not good ways to go. Paul, in a, a wonderful section, the Apostle Paul from 1 Corinthians 9, uh, 19, well, right through uh, effectively to chapter 11, verse 1, where he says he becomes all things to all people. And in as much as he follows Christ, he asks us to imitate him. And so we do need to be empathetic. We do need to become um, a barbarian to the barbarian. We need to become a Gentile to the Gentile. Harper Lee puts it well in one of his characters. You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. I don't know whether you've come across uh, this uh, person. Uh, she uh, uh, she wrote, uh, well, she initially did some research on the Tea Party in America, but they soon morphed into the Trump uh, party. And she wrote this book called Strangers uh, in Their Own Land. Uh, and Ali Hostchard, as a sociologist, she's a feminist, she's an environmentalist. She had this view of people living in Midwest and in the Deep South, Tea Party Republican members. She had a view of them that was far from flattering. And as she got to know them, she became very empathetic for how they felt disenfranchised in their own land. And she concluded this, empathy seems to me to be a tool for really entering a worldview and a perspective at the bottom of which are human feelings. So that's the deep story. It's what T.S. Eliot called an objective relative with a core set of feelings. And it accounts for your sense of being cut out, your fear, anxiety, and anger, and your sense of betrayal. I think it's time for left liberals to realize that we are strangers in our own land and that we are to some degree responsible for becoming that because we've not made the Democratic Party an engine for change for the majority of US citizens. And I haven't got time to, to read this uh, or even explain it, but Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son, it's probably more about the prodigal father, isn't it? Um, he tells a story uh, that's all about the outrage the Pharisees are feeling towards Jesus, who's hanging around with prostitutes, tax collectors, sinners. And he simply says, you know what? Yeah, they have, they do behave pretty badly, don't they? Um, but you've seen nothing yet. Let me tell you about this prodigal son. And all his audience will be thinking, what a disgusting person, having no respect for his family, his father, the business. And then when he ends up eating pig food, he comes crawling back, asking for a roof over his head. Um, so it really does speak into the mindset of the original audience, the Pharisees. He says, yeah, I get that. But don't you see my father values them? He throws a party when one of them comes home. He really loves them. So that story shows great grace to the prodigal, to the person who really fouls up, to the person who's going to be cancelled by secular society, the person who's going to be no platform for something they put on social media, for something they set out of place. There's wonderful grace. But Jesus also in Luke 15 shows real empathy for the older son, for the Pharisee, and says, look, everything I have is yours. Come on into the party. Come on into the feast. My son was lost and is found. So empathy is absolutely vital. Well, if it's so vital, why have I put the dangers of empathy, the dangers of identification? Well, it's vital, but it's not the only tool in the box. It's not the only emotion 
it's not the only, I suppose, aspect of emotional intelligence we can draw upon. If we only focus on empathy and identification, we can easily neglect clarity, often in what we don't say about the gospel. And that leads on to neglecting the very challenges, the claims of the gospel on people's lives. I think we can lose the wonder of grace. And that's never more true than, for example, giving a, an evangelistic talk on cancel culture. I've heard evangelistic talks on cancel culture saying how awful such and such a man is, how awful such and such a person is. Um, and effectively, the message seems to be um, God's not like that. And, and let's ask him to forgive us when we're like that. And of course, it loses the absolute wonder of grace that God does not cancel people. God does not demean people with epithets such as you're a, a toxic man. Um, so let's not lose the wonder of grace. And also let's be aware of distorting the message of suggesting somehow that environmentalism, and it's so important that we are good stewards of God's creation. But if we do a gospel talk that suggests that one day God will restore everything to pre-fall conditions, that will send in genuine environmentalists wild. They'll think it's utterly irresponsible to think there is a second go at this, to think there is a do-over, a start-over. So let's not over distort the message or let's not distort it at all but let's not over emphasize empathy in such a way that we distort the message right very very quickly then uh, i'll just rush through these and then we'll go to questions um here are some top tips uh that i'll share with you i'm sure um these are probably not new to you but give students convictions and tools to open a gospel with a friend. We've done that uh, since 2012 in UCCF, and it's been such a fruitful period. A high quality gospel, good questions, and giving Christians the confidence to give the gospel away and then to read it and discuss it with a friend. That is, that's been a, a, an absolute game changer for us. Help students see that evangelism, Christian students, help them see that evangelism is a process. It's not just a single crisis talk, but it begins with learning to trust the Christian. So they need to be good friends. They need to be on their friend's side. And typically people will become Christians when they trust a Christian enough to either read a gospel with them, to come along to a carol service, to come along to church, to come along to a talk. And for that friendship to not be hindered, by the fact that the gospel has been introduced. We encourage Christian unions to have a threefold strategy, uh, like three legs of a stool, if, if you like. If there are three legs, it's going to be strong. Uh, if there are fewer than three, it's not going to be very stable at all. So personal evangelism, small group evangelism, and the more heraldic set piece proclamation where apologetics, um, uh, preaching from the Bible in a creative and imaginative way is done. And you really do need all three. Uh, CUs, individuals are much more comfortable with personal sharing, small group, and are getting more and more nervous about the set piece. But the set piece is often the place uh, where people make the final decision to come to faith. Help students, Christian students, to respond to the, the culture questions on trans, on other religions, on uh, sexual ethics and let's communicate to the whole person through creative seeker events so the aesthetics important welcome hospitality testimony and story uh, and encourage christians to be engaged in university culture to be good citizens to be involved in other societies and also in choosing set piece themes and titles they don't always need to be confrontational. So I used to do a talk called The Arrogance of Christianity. How can Christians say Jesus is the only way? And why doesn't God stop the suffering? And an alternative to the suffering one is why did God have to write a tragedy? And for the modern student, they're inclined to lean in more and to be less threatened by it and more engaged by it. So some of the negatives um, I see in witness in 
universities, particularly in Christian unions and other small groups, is the Christian bubble. Christians are often content to find other Christians and find a safe place. They mustn't withdraw. Students are fearful of being asked about sexuality and gender issues. That is a real negative. Churches, Christian unions must be equipped much, much more on this. Fragmentation of Christians on campus is such a shame when in many countries, different churches come on and do their own thing. And there isn't a united witness of people from different types of religious tradition. Obviously, the free speech challenges and the fact that Christians are, are lacking confidence that the gospel really is true, relevant and good. It is good news for their gay friends. It's good news for their Muslim friends. It's good news for their trans friends. And um, it's also just finally uh, good to recognize that the cultural assumptions that we perhaps used to have, for example, assuming a knowledge of the Bible, what sin is, and so on and so forth, um, that is a mistake. The students are interested in spirituality, but not necessarily biblical spirituality. They are starting way, way back. And therefore, our language, our mode, our titles, all we do needs to start where they are and be patient in moving them to where God wants them. My final slide. I love this. Uh, Blaise Pascal from his Ponces, his thoughts. He says, men despise religion. By that, he means the Christian religion. Men despise religion. They hate it and are afraid it may be true. The cure for this is to show that religion is not contrary to reason, but worthy of reverence and respect. Next, make it attractive. Make good men wish it were true and then show that it is. Worthy of reverence because it really understands human nature. Attractive because it promises true good. So we really want to commend the gospel as the best story, the deepest story that connects with human longing so that they actually want, want it to be true. And then we need to give them good reasons to believe it's true, that it's worthy of reverence, worthy of our lives. It really understands the human condition. It's really attractive because it promises true flourishing as humans. I'll hand over to Pete. Thanks very much, Richard. That was really an incredible overview and uh, you've given us so much to react to and, and ask you about there. So uh, first of all, uh, Richard, I wanted to ask you, you've been involved in university evangelism and apologetics and particularly uh, giving, giving talks and talks where there's an opportunity for, for dialogue and discussion for, for over 30 years now. Um, in, in what ways have you had to change your own approach uh, during that time uh, to adapt to what's a very new cultural situation? Yeah, so it's, it's a good question, Pete. Um, and of course, one mustn't exaggerate uh, that everything has changed in one direction. So if you go onto a, a more sciencey campus, a Bath University and Imperial College, uh, there are still, even if people aren't card carrying Dawkins followers, um, the, 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 the same assumptions about um, Christianity being, you know, a load of fairy tales, miracles not being possible, that those are still there under the surface. Um, so one still has to have the good apologetics. But I think it is the attitude. I think it first came home to me. I was taking a mission in Cambridge. I think it was about 2015. And I shared a story about my uh, nephew who died aged 11. And I said it in the context of the fact that he had a fine faith and uh, that he was looking forward to heaven. And a student came up to me afterwards, an unbelieving student, and said that she was triggered, emotionally triggered by what I'd shared and thought it was emotional blackmail. Mm. Um, and prior to that, I'd shared that before because David died a few years earlier and it had always resonated and connected. Mm. And so I began to think, oh, dear, there's something in the water. Some Something is happening there is some i would use the term capture now i think some of it is confected i think some of it is just attitudinal people dislike the gospel anyway and so there is a need not to walk on eggshells which is an english phrase 
but more to show that you are kind, that you understand them, their worries, their fears, um, and that the gospel really is about a God who's there, who loves, loves enough to give his only son um, and has gone to a cross. And I think making Jesus central sooner, more substantially, allowing the attractive person of Jesus to walk off the pages of, of a gospel that you're speaking on or a topic you're speaking to um, is perhaps more important than ever. The propositional apologetic stuff I love and there's still a place for it. it has to be there in the toolbox but in the normal campuses and i would think probably medical campuses as well because medics are not typical scientists they they have soft skills they like people they they're bothered about how people feel i th i think i think it's a tone i think it's an empathy um and a little bit uh, the entry point perhaps is slightly different mm. And you talked, you're saying you get to Jesus quicker. I, th I think that's really interesting. And you you mentioned also that a big part of your strategy is encouraging students and giving them the confidence to be able to read the gospel with a friend. And I know UCCF's been working on this for some years now. Can you just unpack that a bit for those who are listening, how you, you go about doing that? Yeah, so... What we did, we we mass produce a very attractive version initially of Luke, then a, a few years later, John and more recently, Mark. And we, in the first instance, got Becky Manley Pepper to write some seeker questions that were designed for you one to one, having given this gospel to a friend to read it with them and discuss six passages uh, that are in the gospel. And uh the the good thing about that is 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 that you do it as an equal you say hey have you ever read um a biography of jesus um since you went to university since since you were an adult would you like the opportunity to to read this one with me it's really attractive and so we gave the christian students three of these gospels and the aim was to pray for th three friends uh, mm -hmm. and give the gospel to three friends and to read with three friends and as a result, about 10,000 students in that first wave of the what we called Uncover Luke uh, mm -hmm. found themselves uh, on the receiving end of a gospel and an invitation to read it. So I think it's confidence and it's the attraction of the product as well, if I can put it pr crudely. Mm. And that's fantastic. It's been amazing to, to watch it and see how successful that has been as well. Now, you talked about the questions that people ask and, and the way they've changed. Can you just unpack that a bit? What, what, what were the main questions you used to get back in the 90s? And then yeah. what, what are the likely, what were the likeliest main questions you'll get now after an evangelistic talk? Yeah. OK, so I think, uh, you know, the, the question is, of how can, how can you say that? whether it's that Christianity is the only way to God, how can you say that I'm a bad person, that I'm going to be judged, that I'm going to be going to hell? You know, what about all the other religions? Um, you know, what? how can God be a God of love if there's so much suffering in the world? So there's quite knotty, thorny, quite technical questions in some ways, forensic questions. How can you believe the Bible's true? How can you believe Jesus rose from the dead? How can you believe he's the son of God? Um, and so on and so forth. Of course, miracles can't happen. It's all a fairy story. Um, I wish I had your faith. You know, those those are all, all the things that are there. Now, uh, the thing about postmodernism and post postmodernism is not that the modernism's gone away, but there's a layer over it. Um, and people are not necessarily invoking those questions. It's not that people do believe. The bible to be reliable that they do believe jesus rose from the dead that they don't think there's a problem with suffering um but they they are perhaps more inclined to think about themselves their their well-being how they can be fulfilled what is actually going to add most to their life um how are they going to be authentic how are they going to be mentally well how are they going to be the best possible them and spiritual spirituality is sort of on the market now. Um, 
when, when, when you've got one or two of the new atheists who are talking about meditation and prayer, I mean, the mind boggles um, because it's selling their books to a to, to a new market. So so the whole place is is very spiritual. Um, and so we mustn't lose our heads. We mustn't be over overly pleased that people will talk about spirituality um, because the offense of the uniqueness of Jesus, the facts of there being a holy God who must be made propitious, whose anger must be turned from sin, heaven and hell, you know, the fact that Jesus is unique way, those things must be in there, um, but they are not the most obvious connecting points and they're not necessarily the most obvious things people object to. People object to um, how can the gospel deny who I am? You know, I'm gay or, you know, I'm um, trans. Uh, how how can you possibly say that gay marriage is wrong? I cannot believe your your message is true and good if it denies something that's at the very heart of my identity and well-being. So those are the the more difficult lifestyle questions. Now, of course, the, the very nature of the gospel is it divides and it's always divided. It's, it's the stench of death to some and the fragrance of life to others. So in a sense, it should not surprise us when people get repulsed uh, by the gospel. But I wonder if we could just come back to this issue of the more unsavory aspects of the gospel in our, our current culture. And you think of Jesus first appearing and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And those two ideas of repentance, first of all, and then the coming judgment uh, are absolutely essential to it. And yet our current uh, culture finds them grossly offensive. And as, as you've alluded, there's a huge temptation for students to to slim down the gospel in order to make it less offensive. Uh, how how do you uh, present the gospel differently to this culture in a way that that um, that includes all the elements of the gospel, including those essential ones? Yeah, well, in, in a sense, I don't think we do <clears throat> present it differently. I think it's more um, it's more dealing with the questions that it's a new set of questions. So uh, the, the sort of hook, the bait to get people along, uh, if it's an angry question, like how can I, how can you say there's a God of love when there's so much suffering? Mm -hmm. Now I think some people can connect to that, but I think some people are weary or wary of something that looks like it might be a shouting match. Um, that there is, I mean, this, this does make me very sad. I, I, I almost long for the days when, you know, you could roll your sleeves up and battle with the new atheists on campus, something to get your teeth into. Um, but 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 they, they are, are not as robust. And so having a talk on suffering with the same elements, the same philosophical and biblical elements in it, but presented as why did God have to write a tragedy? It softens the entry point. It says to people, this is not going to be a sixth form shouting debate, but this is going to be a kind atmosphere. There'll be refreshments. There'll be nice people smiling and welcoming you. And then, of course, it's a safe space, but with a dangerous message. And the message hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, people will be angry. And here's the funny thing. Um, one minute, you know, and this happens with Reading Uncover, one minute people are thrilled at the way Jesus is talking, I don't know, to, to the Samaritan woman. Mm -hmm. And the next minute, they're actually supremely outraged that he says, go and sin no more. Um, <laughs> and, if, you know, uh, and, and I suppose that just goes with the territory. Um, it's not very rational. It's very emotional. Um, and you just sort of, it's like surfing. You just have to stay on the board and try not to be flipped off. Mm -hmm. Can we just building on the the whole issue of offence? And you started off with uh, the 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 slide showing Peter Tatchell and Germain Greer, J.K. Rowling, uh, and and so on. You know, people who've been even Richard Dawkins, who've been no platformed at British universities, and uh, you you've hinted also at the the danger for Christian apologists and uh, evangelists as well. Um, within the UCCF, within your context, have you experienced any no platforming? And if so, over what kind of issues and how have you been able to, to counter that and carry on with your work? Yeah. 
funnily enough, we got three live issues at the moment this week. I mean, uh, that, that even by you know even by today's standards, that's a lot. Um, and, and they are mainly actually about um, who's allowed to come onto campus, who's allowed to be on committee, uh, and that sort of thing. But yeah, we've had situations where um, I'm obviously not going to mention names, but where um, speakers at university missions, which are happening now, the events weeks, have perhaps published something, put something online. I can think of three uh, off the top of my head. Mm. Typically speaking on uh, either gay marriage or going to a church that um, basically uh, wrote to caution uh, the, the the government on a on a particular uh, a bill outlining conversion therapy, where people can become associated with being against gay marriage or having written something in a book on a Christian view of sexuality or um, having signed up uh, or being part of a church that was against. Um, a legislation or for a legislation that seemed to be homophobic, mm. then complaints have gone from student unions direct to um, the Christian union saying, this speaker cannot be allowed on campus. Why? Because um, the mental health, the mental well-being mm. of the students is in danger. Mm. And, th and that's the trump card. If it could cause trauma, if it mm. could cause triggering. And of course, you know, in Western universities, there are designated safe spaces. I did a, a full mission week at York University a few, few years ago, and it was in the designated safe space of York University. And we discussed everything under the sun. I said at the end of the week, I said, hasn't it been great? We've eaten food together. We've discussed ideas together. We've disagreed with each other. And it's been fun. And nobody's died. And and we still like each other. And, that, and everyone clapped. Mm. So... But I fear that um, everyone's just been overwhelmed by it. It's, it's in the water, like fluoride. And and people Christians are just going along with it. Um, I think increasingly young staff in churches, uh, in organisations, will need to be convinced that this isn't normal, that mm. people being made in the image of God um, are more robust than we imagine, and they can cope with challenge. They can cope with disappointment and they can cope with hearing things that are difficult. Yeah. Um, but, but it, but it is hard work and, and the flare ups can happen out of nowhere, just yeah. out of nowhere. Well, but I guess as they did in the new Testament as well, didn't they? They were often yeah. un unpredictable and perhaps we're living in times more like that now. I think that's right, Pete. I think, I think it's exactly like that. Yeah. So uh, Martin Back, is, who's writing, he's a physician in, in South Africa, but writing, thanks, Richard, what, what in your experience are the topics that will interest and encourage and attract young students? What, what are the best titles for talks or, um, you know, apologetics that, that draws people in nowadays? Yeah, I, so, I mean, having, having said what I said, um, I, I still think the suffering thing, uh, is a yeah. huge one. Um, that's really, really important. I do think we need to talk about um, um, environmentalism, but to talk about it in such a way we don't allow the gospel to be captured and to be distorted. Yeah. I think we do want to talk about, um, for example, I mean, it's a bit passe now, but when the whole Me Too thing was happening, you know, mm -hmm. what, what would God say to, and, you know, you can mm -hmm. name whatever rogue from rogues gallery you want to put in that so i think it's right you know the the there's the whole series of talks what would god say to and it might be donald trump um it might be benjamin netanyahu it might mm. be king charles you know mm. so you can relate so people might have a beef about someone people might think oh the gospel is going to really condemn that and so mm. i think connecting with what people are interested in feeling prickly about, feeling irritated by, is really important. So I think those kind of titles uh, that connect with the war in Gaza, that connect with environmentalism, connect with men behaving badly, um, uh, I think I think that's all, all right. But it's really, really important that we don't offer the gospel as a, a sort of, I don't know, as a sop, 
And you know what? The gospel agrees with you too. Um, mm. Uh, mm. It agrees with absolutely everything that you're offended by, the gospel's offended by. Yeah. Um, so there comes a point in the talks where people are, the identification's wonderful, 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 wonderful. Yes. And then the meat of the talk comes in. Yes. Um, and then, and then, and then the fireworks go up. Um, mm. And and so I, so I, to mix my metaphor, I just question how close to the wind we sometimes sail in order to look really contemporary. I think so long as the environment's friendly, creative, good food, good refreshments, lovely warm invitation. I, I'm all for a, a safe space with a dangerous message. Um, mm. And I think perhaps we take up too much time identifying in our talk and don't leave enough time to try and persuade people to the truth and the challenge of the gospel. That, But, you know, I'm at I'm the wrong end of, 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 of Gen X. So <laughs> maybe well, I'm just different. Gen, as a Gen Xer, of course, you have uh, children who are... Uh, gen z or igen so yeah i think there's a close link between between yeah. the two in a way so yeah. uh, you, know, you talked about uh what did come back to this idea of on the one hand people want safe spaces and they don't want to feel judged or uh put down or challenged in any sort of way and yet uh, at the other end there seems to be uh this almost lack of grace and forgiveness to those who don't abide by you know the the current ideology really uh it almost in you know how as christians we were always accused of being intolerant but there seems to be almost mm -hmm. a stronger intolerance now from this new generation than we ever got from the uh the the new atheists even mm -hmm. yeah i mean uh... It's, as a statement, I agree with it. Do you want me to give my penny yeah. with this? What yeah, I, yeah. I mean, just, just what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, at one level, and, Pete, and whether you can use that, perhaps whether you can use that at all, um, you know, point pointing it out. It, it's, yeah. it's almost kind of new kind of Pharisaism, if, if you know. Yeah. New class of heretic. Yeah, I think that's right. I think I think it is all to do with the cultural Marxism, the intersectionality. Um, you know, the, the, there's a sense in which um, it's, you know, it, if I say, oh, why are you attacking me? All I say, oh, I just shared what I genuinely believe to be the case on a Christian sexual ethic. You know, mm. you know, one of the things I will say sometimes when I'm asked a question on on gay marriage, I'll say, look, um, if I don't think you'll be surprised that I hold the biblical view of marriage. But can you imagine me holding that view? without um, uh, being intolerant uh, and hateful and spiteful. Could you imagine anyone holding a biblical view without being all those things? Mm. And often they'll say, no, not really. I say, well, do you see my problem? So <laughs> however nice I demonstrate myself to be, um, you actually have a problem with what I believe. And the source of that belief is not me, doesn't originate with me. It's something Jesus believed and the church has always believed until it's, you know, in the West, it, it, it gave up on it. So I do try that. But I think because of the cultural Marxism, um, I, I need to stop being offended. So, you know, if I said that, they might well turn around and say, oh, poor you. Um, you know, you're being thought of as being, you know, homophobic. You're being thought of as being a bigot. Well, you can handle that. You're white, you're male, you're straight. Get over yourself. Mm. Um, check your privilege. And so it's fine to unleash the dogs of war on me. Yes. Um, it's fine to absolutely hound the, the CU speaker on social media for saying something about Islam or heaven, hell, or sexuality, or men are men and women are women. It's fine. Because just as Marxists redistribute wealth violently, the di redistribution of power and voice is people are never going to offer up the mic. It needs to be wrenched from them. They mm. need to be told off and, and, and sent, you know, skulking into a corner. So there is a violence uh, and a toxicity that's mm. in, it's in the water, it's in the ether. And 
ordinarily nice people what as soon as they get in line online and become keyboard warriors mm. horns just grow out of their head mm. and yeah but i so so i'm mystified how they can be so brutal when they're asking for so much kindness mm. Uh, mm. but those are some of some of the interconnected things which might explain some of it but i think overall i'm mystified mm. Well, Richard, I'm, I'm really sorry that we've run out of time because we've got more questions and there are lots of other things that we would love to discuss. But thank you so much for sharing your insights and your experience today, for, for giving thank up you. your time in preparation and in coming here. Thanks to everyone uh, for coming along and we look forward to seeing you again soon on ICMDA webinars. May the Lord bless you. <laughs>